I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for uh, asking me to do this. This is sort of the the, the fun uh, job uh, amongst everybody in the in the panel because uh, I get to tweak every single one of these people uh, now for uh, 24 minutes and 46 seconds. So um, I would like to recognize the fact that. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of expertise out in the audience and there's not a big enough uh, panel podium uh, space to uh, get all of you up here to comment but there are microphones back there and we're going to have some audience response questions and if you have a difference of opinion or you just like to make a point uh, please move to the microphone quickly I have six cases I don't uh, expect to get through all six um, but I'd like to get through as many as we can so I have nothing to disclose, and we'll get right into the first case. This is a 67-year-old male who's been followed for an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And uh, he's got a little bit of comorbid disease. He's uh, got AFib, he's on Coumadin, he's still smoking. Uh, and on his uh, routine follow-up imaging for his uh, AAA, which he's neglected for a while, uh, he has a new problem identified. So um, there's some stuff in the bottom of the lungs. and there's something in his kidney. And if you look closely, there's something in his renal vein going into his vena cava. And a dedicated chest CT. This is the scout film from the dedicated chest CT. I think you can see all the cannonballs. And uh, this is a few selected cuts from his chest CT. So um, he, to summarize what we've seen, he's got about a 10 centimeter renal mass. He's got an infrahepatic IVC tumor thrombus. He's got pretty significant pulmonary metastatic disease, one of which has been biopsied and read as clear cell renal cell carcinoma. He did have a bone scan. He did have an MRI of his head, both of which were negative. He's anemic. He's got thrombocytosis. So I'll, I'll put it to the panel. And um, I'll start off with uh, Gennady. Uh, so everybody should have a cytoreductal nephrectomy as the first step, correct? Yeah, so while I'm recovering for my loss, which I calculated was uh, statistically not significant, <laughs> I, I, I would like to, to state that this is this continuum, that this patient does not belong in the box of absolutely, and it certainly doesn't belong in the box where I never. But again, we just don't have the time to play with these patients. They are dying in the eight to 14 months. So I, I understand that this is a moderate amount of disease. I wish I had the interval scans and to see how fast this disease came on. And I understand that his prognostic factors are not perfect. Nevertheless, it is somebody I've discussed a cytoreductive nephrectomy with, and I would be willing to proceed. And this is a case that the IVC involvement is not bad. This is a I hate to say it's a quick robotic radical with the IVC thrombectomy robotically, and this patient goes home. And uh, my last one went home in 18 hours. So bottom line is you can certainly perform and uh, debulk him quite a bit. Tom, do you agree with that? Um, yeah, I guess I, get, uh, I guess I do. I mean, he's not terribly well. Uh, he's got quite aggressive disease. And uh, it seems somewhat counterintuitive to go through a major it would be a major operation with the IVC involvement as opposed to starting systemic therapy and seeing what happens. So I, I probably would, I, I agree with that. We probably wouldn't go in and do an nephrectomy up front on this guy right now. Okay. So I'd like you to uh, use your audience. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, Tony, please. Brad, I want to say yes, the performance status comorbidity should drive this. But if you look closely with the platelet number and the hemoglobin, if you look at the HANG IMDC risk criteria, this is very likely a poor risk disease. So an honest uh, approach and a discussion with the patient is necessary here. Honest meaning you're going to recommend against surgery? Not, not necessarily. Not oh, necessarily. Okay, so do we have an audience response for this? <laughs> Everybody's playing nice. We're not in Minnesota anymore, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, the vast majority want uh, upfront systemic therapy with possible cytoreduction. Can we go back to the slides so we can see what happened? So um, 
you know, there's nothing more distressing as a surgeon than operating on somebody and then watching them progress rapidly before they can get systemic therapy. And, um, you know, this is a paper by Alex Kudikoff and uh, Steve when uh, Steve was at Fox Chase looking at uh, the fact that 30% of their cytoreductinephrectomies didn't get postoperative systemic therapy, and most often it was due to rapid progression of disease. And uh, my concern with this patient was that he had relatively high volume pulmonary metastatic disease and had a little shortness of breath. Um, so uh, what we did was what the vast majority of the audience wanted us to do. He was started on sunitinib. Um, he had one cycle of sunitinib and actually had an encouraging response. So, Tom, we're going to use this approach in this patient now. Uh, how long before we consider doing something more? Uh, so, um, my, my said we, we've done um, probably, I guess, about 150 patients using this approach one way or another in the trials we've done. And one of the things that my surgeons, or my surgeons, the surgeons I work with, uh, um, they you can't go on a surgeon. They come back yeah. and say, after about three cycles, they're noticing quite a lot of fibrosis, a lot of necrosis, and actually the surgery is becoming more difficult. And so they're encouraging us to try and give a shorter period of upfront therapy of about 12 weeks. And we're doing a scan about 12 weeks, and if they're responding and things are going well, then we would then plan surgery over the next four-week period. That's what we do. Okay. So uh, it wouldn't have made it into a presentation if there wasn't something interesting about it. He actually did extremely well, and uh, we offered him uh, surgery in uh, six months, but he wanted to quit smoking before he had an operation, so we were pleased to hear that. Um, this is his imaging at nine months, so pre is on the left side, post is on the right side. primary tumor, and nothing in the renal vein or vena cava anymore. So after nine months, he's had some response in the primary tumor, near complete resolution of his pulmonary metastatic disease. Uh, tumor thrombus is gone or nearly gone. His performance status is great. He's quit smoking. Um, Gennady, does he have to have his primary tumor removed now? I'm afraid of the audience. <sighs> One thing I still don't know is if we did the uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy first and then would have given them a systemic therapy, now we wouldn't have this dilemma. But uh, since we have the tumor in place, I'd still clean him up. I would. You would take it out. So uh, very quickly, audience response, does he have surgery, does he have more systemic therapy, or do we do something else? Okay, so uh, next slide. Everybody wants us to take out the tumor. That's what he did. Uh, he went ahead and had his surgery. He had negative lymph nodes. Um, he was a T1B, uh, grade two with uh, necrosis, which I don't know if that means anything, John, in the post-treatment uh, setting, does not. Um, no sarcomatoid features. So um, uh, Tom, does he need ongoing therapy? Uh, so that's now become a very difficult question. Um, that's why we're asking. And um, I am, during this pre-treatment break, you've been off therapy for about, I guess, four to six weeks. And we would probably scan at this point to see if there's a rebound. And certainly, if there has been progression, we would definitely restart therapy. I, I mean, we are restarting therapy in all of our patients, but this obviously has now been quite a long period of time. And there's a little bit of data, which is obviously retrospective and all the shortcomings associated with that, about cessation of targeted therapy in individuals who have had a spectacularly good response, and they are having a treatment break. But, and there are one or two studies looking at this treatment break issue, but I mean, we're not keen on pursuing that outside of a clinical trial, so we would start systemic therapy, particularly if there's a rebound in the tumor. So he does resume sunitinib, and uh, this is uh, now quite a ways out. He uh, remains uh, NED should he continue his therapy. He's still on sunitinib. Tom? 
Oh, so, I mean, we would keep going, but sometimes patients come back to me and say, I've had enough, I want some time off, and you kind of have to respect that a little bit. So, um, but we wouldn't stop in the first year. After a year of therapy, we would be reluctant to stop, but, you know, there are some, some retrospective data out there suggesting it may be safer, so, sorry, not safer, may be safe. Um, so it would be reasonable, but we wouldn't recommend it. It's patient-driven to some extent. Ed? Yeah, <clears throat> I just worry that the... Uh, the excellent case presentation that you just made is going to maybe make people change their practice pattern. And uh, unfortunately, I think millions of people play the lottery every day without winning, with the hopes of winning. And appropriately selected patients with clinical pathologic and molecular profiling that um, it puts them in an appropriately selected group have the chance to win the lottery about 8% of the time with side reductive nephrectomy and high dose IL-2, for instance. So uh, I just don't want us to forget about those people. Duly noted. So this is an extreme example, uh, obviously. I think maybe you'll be more satisfied with some of the next ones. Um, so the next case is a 44-year-old male who complained of some shoulder pain. His local doc injected his shoulder but decided we'll just get an x-ray. They saw sternal mass. This was biopsied, read as clear cell RCC in the bone. And he was referred for an opinion on site of reduction after he had received some radiotherapy. And, and he's basically asymptomatic now. So you can see this destructive lesion in the bone. He's got some things that the radiologists call micronodules, which I had to spend some time to find. And then you can see there's something in uh, both the right kidney and the left kidney. And he's got another bone lesion in his iliac bone. So panel, this is a 44-year-old male with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. He's got sternal and iliac bone mets. Bone scan shows nothing anyplace else. He's got bilateral renal masses. He's uh, medically reasonably healthy. And all of his other labs are normal with a serum creatinine of 0 0.9. Jose, does this patient deserve complete resection of two bone lesions and his primary tumors? I'm not sure about deserving or not, but I wouldn't remove that initially. I mean, the, he is a very young patient, which is a good thing, but having two large bony mats, that will probably sway me away from doing even a cytoreductive nephrectomy up front, um, considering that he has bilateral renal tumors as well. So if we do a left nephrectomy, what do we do about the right one? Do we just keep it there or ablate it? And the iliac bone looks like it's going to need some treatment at some point as well but the bulk of the disease outside of the kidney is worrisome. So I would probably not do a cytoreductive nephrectomy or metastasectomy as of yet. So you're going to recommend upfront systemic therapy? Yes. Okay. Gennady, yeah, I see you reaching. Yeah. I, perhaps when you got a hammer. Uh, Everything's a nail. <laughs> this is a uh, relatively straightforward case to me. Uh, I think the, the age and the, the age of this patient dictates what I'm going to do. I'm going to give this very patient, as I try to do to most of the patients, a benefit of a doubt. This is a patient that I would debulk, and this is a patient that I would actually strongly recommend metastasectomy, understanding that he may actually uh, fail. Uh, but uh, I, I, at this point, this patient has a ligo metastatic disease. There is uh, Angel Eld's data that clearly shows that even when you resect more than one side of disease, these patients do better. And I think just because it's a bone and it's a bulky disease, I think this is a resectable disease, and I would absolutely recommend metastasectomy with a, a primary tumor the bulk and, uh, removal as well. I think bone lesions, we can't treat them all the same. I mean, if somebody has a skull met, we can't you know, consider that as just a simple bone lesion. Most of the studies with bone metastasectomy are spine, which you can resect a portion of it and replace, humerus or femur, and not as much the, uh, you know, uh, manubrium, which he will basically need resection of his chest wall with plastic surgery reconstruction, which will delay his healing, which means he won't be able to receive targeted therapy in time. 
Well, so but, yeah, I, I agree, and that's what we probably want to see some blood on the stage. But uh, I, I do think that uh, the, this patient is too young, and I would go over the wall closure uh, and the resection of the iliac bone with aggressive orthopedic surgeons. Okay, uh, so w we have an opportunity to break up the fight. Um, I, th I, th I think I must be missing something because people are concentrating on the bone. And what would worry me about this patient is his kidneys and actually trying to get local control there to prevent him progressing there and going on dialysis. In other words, I'd like to see more of the pictures of his kidney and sort out what we're going to do about that first and then return to the issue of the bone. So I'll put it to the other surgeons on the panel, other than Jose and Gennady, uh, what do you think about doing uh, one kidney, the other, or neither kidney as the uh, beginning of this person's therapy? Brian, Steve, Jeff? Uh, I would just also comment, this patient is 44 years old, has bilateral multifocal disease. I would definitely refer this patient to a genetic counselor uh, for genetic testing, uh, panel-based testing now. But uh, we can't assume that both sides, one tumor has metastasized to the other side. This could easily be an aggressive, you know, left-sided primary and just a de novo new lesion on the right side. But, uh, uh, you know, you, you would probably, in a 44-year-old man, if you're going to go after the tumors, you know, you'd probably go after both of them. But, uh, you know, the one on the, you could consider maybe be biopsying both sides and seeing, you know, if there's disconcordance. I mean, you can't rely on a biopsy to necessarily grade tumors accurately, but uh, it may give you better insight into the biology of both sides. Raj? I'm not sure uh, which side I would fall on in this case, but I would remind the audience that um, in the days and age of excellent probe ablation therapy, some of these lesions, whether they're in the kidney or even in some of these bones, maybe not the manubrium, but certainly in the iliac, um, there might be an integration of surgery as well as probe ablation therapy. Um, so don't forget about that. So we remembered all that, and uh, this was made uh, relatively easy for us, but before I get to what actually happened, let's uh, go to the audience response. Systemic therapy, no surgery, systemic therapy with surgery based on uh, response to systemic therapy, surgery, then systemic therapy, or something else? So 56% want some upfront therapy, and the majority of the rest want to start off with cytoreduction. Okay, can we go back to the slides? So um, this was made easy because it was relatively recent, and we discussed with him all of the things that uh, have been discussed so far, but when we mentioned a clinical trial, he, he bit at that. Uh, so uh, just in August, uh, I did bilateral partial nephrectomies in the same setting, uh, uh, perhaps indicating, as Brian, said, that, as Brian said, these are two different tumors. He had a grade four clear cell on the left, the nastier-looking tumor, and a grade two on the right. Uh, so the tumor collection was from the left-sided tumor. Uh, he was randomized to the control arm, uh, and unfortunately, he's uh, progressing in his hip. So he's NED in his uh, abdomen, but uh, you can see that iliac bone is uh, getting worse. Uh, so I'll update you in a future meeting on that one. Let's try to get through one more. This is a 63-year-old male with a six-week history of uh, mid-epigastric pain. Uh, He's had no radiation of his pain. Uh, nothing makes it better, nothing makes it worse. Uh, and otherwise, uh, he's doing fine. He's got a large primary tumor, a 12 centimeter enhancing solid mass. There's no adenopathy seen. His chest is negative. Uh, his labs are normal. So um, let's go straight to the audience. Uh, what do we do with this? Uh, do we take out his kidney and his adrenal? Do we uh, take out his kidney, his adrenal, and his lymph nodes? Uh, or does he uh, not have his adrenal removed without and with lymph nodes?
So the vast majority want maximal uh, surgery. Uh, okay, Gennady's shaking his head already. <laughs> uh, Jeff, let's start with you. Uh, do you uh, agree that this patient should have a lymphadenectomy in the absence of uh, clinically evident disease in the retroperitoneum? Not necessarily, honestly. I, um, frankly, I think that could be done laparoscopically. I mean, it's not with a hand in there, of course. I, I cheat and put my hand in there and just wrestle with the thing. Um, and I certainly, doing an nephrectomy, I certainly would remove nodes at some level. I would definitely take the paracable nodes. I'd pluck off, sorry to use that word, the, uh, at least the, the superficial inter cable lymph nodes, and I would leave the adrenal, frankly. There, I'd, if I saw that correctly, there was no evidence of adrenal involvement. It was, a, a, I think, a lower or mid to lower pole tumor. And while I know that he has some degree of um, risk of adrenal involvement, honestly, in my own experience, I've seen people develop contralateral adrenal lesions just as often as ipsilateral adrenal lesions uh, in a, you know, in a metachronous, metachronous fashion. Um, so I'm, my, my tendency is to leave the adrenal gland in. Should he develop contralateral adrenal disease, uh, he's still got his ipsilateral adrenal in place. So I, I swear this isn't a setup. Uh, these guys have not seen these cases. Uh, so uh, actually there's some data on that, and uh, it turns out that uh, if you look at patients uh, that have adrenalectomy and patients that don't have adrenalectomy at the uh, time of taking care of their primary tumor, uh, in patients that uh, have the adrenal left in situ, the risk is equal in the lip ipsilateral and contralateral adrenal gland and ipsilateral adrenalectomy doesn't make a difference in terms of the likelihood of developing a subsequent adrenal metastasis in the contralateral side. So, um, you know, uh, we uh, actually would advocate against adrenalectomy. So uh, he did have a lap radical nephrectomy. Uh, it was a PT2, uh, supposedly, John, without necrosis, without sarcomatoid features. Uh, and uh, then he comes back with this, an ipsilateral adrenal met, so um, uh, he had it, and then uh, a pulmonary met. So uh, Jose, is this patient a good candidate for metastasectomy? Three and a half years out, and this is the only sites of metastatic disease you found, right? That's right, and they're both biopsied as renal cell carcinoma. Uh, yes. He's a healthy gentleman, otherwise with good ECOG performance status, uh, less than 70 years of age, more than two years disease-free interval with two resectable lesions, he could qualify for that. So it doesn't matter to you that there's two lesions no. at the same time in two different organs? No. Steve, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, no, I would agree with Jose. I think that this is a, an appropriate candidate for metastasectomy, and I think that, um, you know, we often see, as, as Jose brought up, uh, people who have come to us who haven't been considered for metastasectomy because they have, you know, for example, multiple metastatic lesions. And I think it should be guided a lot more by the comorbidity status of the patient and the resectability of lesions rather than the number. So I, I would recommend metastasectomy for this gentleman. Okay. So I... <coughs> oh, hello, Dr. Figley. No, come on. There's room for both of you. There's room for both of you. Um, age before beauty, Dr. Figley. Okay, first. Dr. Figlin. <laughs> I'm not so sure I, I, who's more aged. I'm not going to get in the middle of that one. You're both beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. You're welcome. Um, so I, I think that it, it would be important for you to at least have a conversation about the role of non-surgical metastectomies, using SBRT and other modalities to approach these two lesions, which are becoming much more common. Data is not, not as mature, but at least enter the conversation about whether you think these two lesions can appro be approached non-surgically. Can we get the audience response going to get a vote on Dr. Figlin's comment because it's sort of in here? Um, similar um, to Dr. Figlin, I. There's something that hasn't been mentioned at all by anybody on the panel, and that is a trial of time before you go for metastatectomy. So this is a real classic. You don't know whether the sudden development of metastases in this patient in two sites is a harbinger of very aggressive uh, metastatic disease in this setting. So 
we would never, in my institution, go immediately to metastatectomy in these patients. We would repeat the scan in somewhere between six, eight, maybe 10 weeks' time just to double check the pace of disease before sending in one of my surgeons. They're my surgeons, Tom, since I appointed them all. <laughs> so Can I have a comment about trial of time? Because nobody's mentioned it. I'm a little bit surprised. I think that's a good point. And um, that was sort of the point behind option three here, is do you watch it for a bit of time to see if, if this is a disease that's about to explode? And I'd like to ask anybody in the panel, does the three-year disease-free, three-and-a-half-year disease-free interval sway you uh, in that regard? Absolutely. I mean, this is oligometastatic disease. Now, of course, he could explode with disease. He could just as easily not. Um, time to development of a systemic disease is the consistent uh, variable that's been predicting a good response to metastasectomy. And so, yes, perhaps it's been quiescent for three and a half years, and all of a sudden it's going to overrun him. But that seems unlikely, frankly. I think that doing a laparoscopic adrenalectomy, and you could even do an RFA of that pulmonary lesion with minimal morbidity. So the idea that you're going to subject somebody to a, some you know, barbaric procedure to render him NED is, I think, false. And that being optimistic, as I'm unfortunately very prone to doing, um, I think is re very reasonable in this time. So actually, both of those lesions are treatable with a percutaneous ablation. You could ablate the lung mass and the adrenal mass without making an incision at all. 